there are different types of diabetes, but the two big ones are type 1, which is an autoimmune disease. We still don't know what exactly causes it. And type 2, which Guo Qiang has. It has multiple risk factors, including being overweight and family history. Type 2 diabetes accounts for 90% of all diabetes cases. And so we need to focus on actually the risk factors for diabetes, in particular obesity. The problem is that aging is a risk factor, but obesity is also a risk factor for diabetes. And in particular, um, obesity among the young. And what we have seen is that obesity among the young, you know, those 30 years and below, have been increasing quite rapidly in recent years in terms of our uh, control of obesity. And the population hasn't come to a stage whereby they derive an internal motivation. So you need to have people with a value system where they want to value health just as much as uh, wealth. So with the survey results, 60% of people who have been diagnosed with diabetes are not controlling it well. Tell me, what does it mean to control well your diabetes? Yeah, so in terms of control for diabetes, it's essentially that I need to make sure that your blood sugar level do not fluctuate much and should not be very high. So 60% is quite a lot. Why is it that they are not controlling the diabetes? One of the big reasons is it's such a silent condition. I may be a diabetic and I don't feel unwell. So it, it kind of forces uh, or creates a certain sense of complacency okay, because I don't feel sick. But it is at that silent phase that it actually continues to damage our blood vessels, which in turn leads to all the long-term complications. And there are still 20% of the population out who are diabetics and do not know that they're diabetics. Okay? So if I have half a million diabetics in my cluster, that means I have 100,000 that I do not know. That but when you put it that way, it sounds like a lot. It is a lot. Yeah. High blood sugar levels, which is one of the characteristics of diabetes, damages the blood vessels, as well as the tiny filaments in the kidney called nephrons. When this happens, the kidney no longer functions properly. But it can take years, so managing the condition correctly may prevent someone from getting to this stage, which makes me wonder, why are we letting our diabetes spiral so out of control? Studies have shown that barriers to managing diabetes properly include inability to adhere to regular meal timings, limited healthy food options, difficulties in maintaining a physical fitness routine, and forgetting to take medication on time. Why is self-management so difficult? Well, Diana, you know, human behaviours are not rational, right? We often struggle, even if we know what we're supposed to do, to practice it consistently day after day. But with the tools that technology offers, it's empowering. How does the new technology help someone to self-manage diabetes better? We now have the option of monitors such as these. These are called continuous glucose monitors or CGM. They are placed on the arm or the tummy. Now how these work is that there is no needle that stays in your system or your body but rather it's a tiny little monofilament that is able to measure glucose levels in a space called the interstitial space on a continuous basis. It will then automatically transmit the levels of this glucose and importantly the patterns of this glucose uh, to your cell phone or a reader. CGMs track blood sugar levels 24 hours a day can transmit these readings every 1 to 15 minutes. This provides plenty of data points showing how the wearer's levels fluctuate throughout the day. Or CGM devices like this have been on the market for about two decades. They help improve self-management of diabetes by providing precise real-time information of one's blood glucose levels. I got myself fitted with one for 10 days to find out exactly how it works. For this experiment, I've decided to change up my diet by going for high-carb, high-sugar food. 
There were days that I carried on with my workouts after a meal high in carbs and sugar. So it tells me that your body's ability to regulate glucose is very good, is normal. If I were to draw this out for you, you can see that on the days when you had food with not much of free sugars in it, like the salad day, the fluctuation in your glucose was very minimal, right? And that's because when you have very little free sugars or very little carbohydrates, it's very easy for the pancreas to deal with it. So if you had, say, bubble tea or you had fruit juice, you would see a rapid rise in glucose just like the first case. But there was another day when I had Brussels sprouts, which was a little bit oily with lots of garlic in it. And I noticed that my blood sugar levels really spiked. Why did that happen? I mean, it was vegetables, right? So with that, what you saw is that your sugar was within the range, but it actually stayed on the higher side for longer. So this is the effect of fiber and oil that you're seeing. Whenever there is oil or whenever there is fiber, it slows down the whole process. The next set of experiments, uh, I had the same breakfast foods. One day, I had exercise. What was the impact of the exercise on my glucose levels? During exercise, your muscles actually eat up glucose. And the good thing is that they do not need insulin to eat up the glucose. So that means even in people with absolutely no insulin production, their glucose will drop when they exercise. In your case, we saw this. Your glucose levels rose up similarly with the meal, but once you started your exercise, it dropped down to normal much faster. So the lesson is exercise is actually quite critical for someone with diabetes. With diabetes. Yes, exercise definitely helps manage your sugars better. How will the results differ in someone who has diabetes? We can take a look at uh, the picture here. So one of the critical thing was when we looked at the time in range for you, it was 100%. That means 24 hours a day your glucoses were in target. This is a person with diabetes whose HbA1c is 8.3. And if we look at the number of hours, almost 12 hours a day, which is quite important because half the day this person's sugar is high. What is the difference between blood sugar rising sharply and rising gradually? Looking at people with diabetes, we definitely have proof that large sharp fluctuations of glucose and like in this case you can see going up from 6 all the way to 20 and then dropping back down to 9, these fluctuations matter. Why do they matter? This has been related to a higher chance of getting heart problems, strokes and heart attacks. Besides the foods that we eat, are there other things that we cause our blood sugar levels to spike? Yes. So one of the common things that we will see is the effect of stress. We see that, for example, athletes who are training for an event, during the training we find their glucose level drops. But the, on the day of the event, when they go for the competition, their glucose go up. And that's because they are stressed, right? We can see it in a young person preparing for an exam. One other important thing is sleep, lack of deep sleep. It could uh, reflect as a higher glucose levels on the next day. Because my body is producing and using insulin as it should, I need not worry about these fluctuations in my blood sugar level. But a person with diabetes will need to adjust his diet and lifestyle accordingly if he wants to maintain his targeted blood sugar levels without the use of medication. So while a doctor is the best person to help people with diabetes on their journey to good health, it does make sense to say that eating well, maintaining a healthy weight and leading an active lifestyle is something we could all benefit from.